This evening, Australia sweeps aside the West Indies in the second test. Australia's bowlers again dominated, condemning the hosts to a 277-run loss inside four days. So I think the selectors obviously deserve a lot of credit for, for picking the players they have, um, and the boys deserve a lot of credit for grabbing their opportunities. Hello, I'm Peter Wilkins, and this is Grandstand. It's good to have your company. Australia will head into the Ashes series in England in confident form after thrashing the West Indies in the second test at Sabina Park. The Australians completed a series whitewash with a 277-run victory, with the home side offering little resistance on day four. Neil Cross reports. This became a contest in name only as a procession of West Indies batsmen failed to cope with the Australian attack yet again. From an overnight position of two for 16, the team referred to in its heyday as the Calypso Kings was quickly reduced to poorly performing paupers. Five wickets fell in the first session. Oh, that's a beauty. With an Ashes battle following so soon after this series, there was always the possibility the Australians could lose focus. Clearly that wasn't the case. I'd be lying to say it hasn't been in the back of everyone's mind. I love the fact that we've been able to win these two test matches. I've spoken a lot about consistency away from home. Um, I just hope this is the start of it. With all of the pacemen aware Ryan Harris will join them on the Ashes campaign, player of the series Josh Hazelwood has made his case for inclusion in the first test against England. Five wickets in the first innings gets his second here. The Australians needed less than seven of the scheduled ten days play to sweep the two test series. Free now to talk about the English, Michael Clark was matter of fact in assessing their new coach, former New South Wales mentor Trevor Bayliss. TB will do a fantastic job for England. Um, he coached Sri Lanka when we played against Sri Lanka, so there'll be no real surprises. There'll be shock rippling through the Australian camp, though, after compatriot Moses Enriquez was badly injured playing county cricket. Enriquez broke his jaw in three places, while Surrey teammate Rory Burns suffered head injuries. Neil Cross, ABC News. State of Origin Rugby League returns to the MCG on Wednesday night and organisers are confidently expecting one of the biggest crowds in the code's history. As Jennifer Browning reports, the New South Wales and Queensland coaches were sizing up the venue today. The oval is out, the rectangle is in and the excitement is building. All the players are really excited. Uh, most of them have never been to the MCG, <laughs> let alone played um, on, on the venue. It's worldly renowned, so um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fabulous we're down here and, and uh, playing a rugby league match. The Origin coaches met today ahead of Wednesday night's game in Melbourne, but it's not the first time they've faced off at the MCG. He shows it to Fittler, tries to do it, he's up, there's a try! The pair met in the first Origin to be played at the ground in 1994 when New South Wales prevailed 14 0. I played in 94 with Laurie and, and the Queensland side. Uh, we're dominated you know, hugely, so I'm um, looking forward to you know, turn the tables. The Blues will be looking to turn their most recent form around after last month's one-point loss. We'll be better than game one. More than 85,000 tickets have already been sold to Wednesday night's game and league officials expect the record crowd of 87,000 that watched the first Origin game here 21 years ago will be broken. Meninga says the presence of the storm has been instrumental in making Victorians more aware of the game in the AFL's heartland. We're not going to take over from AFL down here, but in '94 was an uneducated crowd. And I'm guessing, you know, in 2015 here on Wednesday night, there'll be an educated crowd and the atmosphere will be, will be fantastic. Both teams will get to put the MCG to the test with their final training sessions tomorrow. Jennifer Browning, ABC News, Melbourne. Adelaide star Rory Sloan has recommitted to the Crows, signing a three-year deal today. The 25-year-old was expected to field offers from several Melbourne-based clubs, but has opted to stay in South Australia and will remain with the Crows until at least 2018. And look, I was really comfortable with where we are at the whole time and um, had constant talks with the footy club and Dave Noble in particular. And, uh, we were really comfortable with where it sat. We just needed some time to, to think about, I suppose, things outside of football. 
With Sloan signed up, Crows midfielder Patrick Dangerfield, who's not contracted next season, will draw the attention of recruiters. Meanwhile, the Giants have received bad news after their loss to Collingwood, with key defender Joel Patful set to miss a month with a punctured lung and broken ribs. Grandstand AFL commentator Clint Wilden joins me from Perth to look back on the weekend's action. And uh, first of all, the Magpies. Uh, they've, they've cemented their place high on the table and GWS counting the toll of, of many injuries. The, uh, the one just mentioned, one of many. No doubt about that, Wilco. It looked really tough for GWS. They were very competitive in that first half, but then the likes of Stephen Cornelio, Phil Davis, his injury was a real blow. It allowed Travis Cloak to really get off the hook, and, and he's been in terrific form. And as we saw, of course, Patful uh, and Mumford will be a loss if he's not able to get up in uh, the upcoming weeks for the Giants. But look, let's talk about the Magpies. Plenty of questions about how they've been travelling. They still haven't been genuinely tested, and we'll get a really good idea about how they're placed after the bye We've got a really interesting draw after the bye. Fremantle, Hawthorne, Port Adelaide and West Coast. So while they're 8-3, and three, and you can't argue with that, and I have really like what Travis Cloak has done in the last two weeks. I mean, 12 goals now in two weeks. Seven the week before against Melbourne. Clunked a couple of beauties and was really dangerous again in the second half uh, against the GWS Giants. He's in good form. And while he's up and about, so too at Collingwood. I like Taylor Adams. He's been a good recruit from the Giants. He's been very solid for them. But I still think we just have to wait a little bit, Wilco, until we see how they go that month after the bye. Eight and three is great, but the big tests are to come. Let's uh, move on. The, uh, the Cats, they took their first uh, big uh, scalp of the season. Uh, they were written off early on. Uh, this was a good sign, though, against good opposition. Well, Port Adelaide, really, this big question mark over Port now, Wilco, and how they're travelling. I certainly would have agreed with you that look, it was a big scalp earlier in the year, but I'm not sure how Port are quite travelling at the moment. Bad loss for them, but as you say, a really good result for Geelong. I like the way that they keep going about their business. The two rucks work together really well. Uh, Blitzavs has been outstanding. Stanley's been a really good pickup for the Cats as well. And the way that they were able to dominate Matthew Loby was a real key to Geelong's victory. Terrific result for them. Uh, they're only out of the top eight on percentage, and I certainly wouldn't be writing the Cats off of making the finals. Not sure if they can finish top four. And in fact, I have to say at the moment, I'd be very doubtful if they can, but they will be about in September. And of course, 299 gamer on the weekend, Corey Enright. He was one of the absolute stars for the Cats. He's 300th, just the third Cat to play 300 games, and indeed only the 70th in AFL uh, history. So, terrific result for him. But you're right, Geelong, they've got a nice mix of youngsters coming through and still plenty of experience. Now, uh, Clint, the Eagles, they had a bit of uh, uh, hammerage last week uh, against North. Uh, plenty of stars in this game. They put the Bombers to the sword. They certainly did. Look, Essendon were dreadful for the second week in a row, and now three weeks in a row they've failed to kick 60 points. Uh, real problems for the Bombers. They gambled not to take a recognised Ruckman across to Subiaco. Certainly backfired, but they're a club playing without heart. As for West Coast, a nice way to bounce back after being disappointing in that final term against North Melbourne the week before. Uh, they really are a side that's improved. I really like what Elliot Yeo's done to their midfield, and certainly the way that West Coast are travelling. Eight and three. Uh, we like what they're doing at the moment, the Eagles. They have been a genuine surprise packet, no doubt about that. And they've got a very good draw too. They don't face the big three again until later in the season, around 17, 19 and 20 when they're up against Sydney, Hawthorne and uh, Fremantle. And they get all those games at home. But again, that's where we'll get a genuine idea of where the Eagles are at. But they're doing everything that they need to do at the moment. And of course, when you've got the likes of Josh Kennedy, who's on top of the Coleman medal list, and of course, Mark Lacrasse, super valuable. And Nick Natanui, who could just run a mark with no Ruckman to face him. West Coast were pretty good, no doubt. Now, North uh, teased their fans with uh, a performance where they kept on coming against the Swans, but the Swans had done enough. Uh, the big names kicking goals and the midfield going superbly. Yeah, gee, they're a good side, the Sydney Swans. Buddy Franklin with four again. Adam Goods weighed in with three. North made hard work of it to kick their goals, and, and that was the problem. Too often, North would work really hard, get the goal, and then Sydney would find an easy response, and I thought it was very frustrating. I can feel for the North Melbourne fans. Again, not quite good enough. Uh, at least they did, as you say, uh, Wilco. They battled it out, but Sydney... 
they're just going to be a red hot team again. And mm. I've said it from right from the start. We've all said it. They're going to be around the mark. And when you've got so many good players as they do and so many avenues towards goal, you've just got to like the way Sydney go about their footy. All right, uh, uh, time's going to beat us, but we've got a couple of matches quickly to talk about. And the Dockers, uh, gee, they squeaked home against a, a weakened uh, Suns team. Uh, might this one have been just in the head after last week's performance, or are they just having a little bit of a hiatus of form? I just think they've had two tough weeks, Wilco. Look, the weather definitely brought the sides back together. Give Gold Coast some credit. They battled really hard. They tackled. Their pressure skills were good. Fremantle, I think the buys come for them at the right time. They do miss Michael Johnson, but then they don't have to travel for the next three weeks, and I think that's perfect for Fremantle. I think we can give them the last two weeks against Richmond <laughs> and that sneaky loss. I mean, if they kick straight, though, we wouldn't even be talking about it because they would have thumped Gold Coast. So I wouldn't panic about Freo just yet, Wilco. And the pulsating result of the weekend, the, uh, uh, the St Kilda-Melbourne match, just a couple of points in it, the sealer with uh, just seconds to go. Incredible game of football, great to see these two teams. You could almost call it like a, a young talent time, these two sides that boast so many of the, the really rising stars of the competition. The frustration has got to be for Melbourne. Why didn't they have a man back in those last 40 seconds when they were in front? Whose fault it was, the senior players, the coach... We'll never know, but that was so disappointing for them. They delight for the Saints and Lee Montagna right at the end. Good on you, Clint. Uh, yeah, good stuff in that tight game. Thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to your company again very soon. Good on you, Wilco. Olympic gold medalist Sally Pearson has confirmed she'll miss this year's World Championships in China. Pearson will have a second operation tomorrow to repair the wrist she broke in a race fall in Rome 10 days ago. She won't recover in time to compete in the August Championships. I haven't had a break since 2003, my first Australian team. Um, so I think this will be a very good mental and physical break for me. Pearson says a calf tear led to her fall, but she's yet to have that injury assessed. In basketball, the Golden State Warriors are just one victory away from winning the NBA championship after beating the Cleveland Cavaliers 104-91 in Oakland, California. Australia's Matthew Dellavedova was in the thick of the action again in Game 5, but it was league MVP Steph Curry who had the last laugh over his Australian opponent as the Warriors went on a late run in the fourth quarter. I'm trying to do his job, I'm trying to do mine. Um, and hopefully at the end of the day, on Tuesday, we can you know, own that trophy and, uh, and be proud of that. That's all I'm worried about. LeBron James had more than 40 points for the fourth time in the series. The Cavaliers will need another big game from James when the series returns to Cleveland for Game 6. South Korea's NB Park has won the Women's PGA Championship for the third straight year. Park started the round with a two-stroke advantage and played near flawless golf to squeeze out the opposition. She had five birdies in the final round on the way to a five-stroke victory. Park's sixth major title also puts her back on top of the women's world rankings. I just really wanted to be, you know, to be number one when I was really ready. And this is like the perfect tournament, perfect timing to go up there. So, um, yeah, really happy. Park's 19-year-old compatriot, Hu Ju Kim, produced the shot of the day with a hole-in-one at the 14th. She entered the tournament on eight under par, one stroke behind Australia's Kari Webb, who finished seventh. Australian surfer Owen Wright has scored a rare perfect heat to move into the quarterfinals of the Fiji Pro. Wright received back-to-back -back tens in big conditions to record the seventh flawless heat in the history of pro Man, surfing. I thought 20 points would happen for me in my life and... Out, I'm stoked. I don't know, like 20 points is one of those things you don't really think about and then all of a sudden it's like, it was every bit of opportunity out there. Earlier fellow Australian Joel Parkinson dished up a perfect 10 of his own to move into the final stages of the competition. New South Wales surfer Kai Otten knocked out Queensland's Mick Fanning. And that's Grandstand for now. Don't forget you can also watch us on iView and Grandstand Online. See you soon.